Let's talk about the Kennedy assassination. This is our national whodunit. Okay. Uh, there's John F. Kennedy, and you can see off on the side there, LBJ, the vice president at the time. Uh, historian and CFR member Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., in his book on the Kennedy presidency, A Thousand Days, wrote that Kennedy had no part in the New York establishment. By raise of hand, how many know what the New York establishment is? Okay, there's all one of you. Now, oh, two, there you go. Okay, uh, to, me, to be really brief, it takes a long time to establish that. Uh, but if you think CFR, you're pretty close to bagging them. CFR stands for what? Council of Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations, okay? Which is in New York City. Hey, All right, let's Steve. go ahead. Steve. Right, now, this guy, one of the movers in the New York establishment was Averill Harriman. That's, that is he, the old crocodile. Uh, he was the administrator of Lend-Lease when we gave stuff to Britain. Uh, World War II, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, Truman's Secretary of Commerce, the governor of New York, the negotiator of the nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union, the Vietnam Peace Chief Negotiator, and founder of the magazine that became Newsweek. And that's all just in his spare time. Okay? He was, the big deal is, under the picture, he was a senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman and Company. Okay? Big, big brokerage. Go ahead. Okay, now, Averill Harriman was the son of Union Pacific Railroad robber baron and shipping magnet E.H. Harriman. Born to riches, young Averill attended Yale University, where he was initiated into the infamous Skull and Bones Secret Society. In the 1920s, Harriman and Bones buddy Robert Lehman organized Pan American Airlines. By 1932, Harriman sat on the boards of 54 corporations, including Mobile Oil. Okay? And there he is there with uh, Molotov, the guy the cocktail's named after. <laughs> yeah, on, on his right, our left. And uh, there's Winston Churchill on the other side. Okay? So, you know, you got to understand, Averill Harriman could move in any society he wanted to. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay, so the question is who killed the president? Harriman dictated policy in both the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Known in his later years as the old crocodile, Harriman bullied his way even in the White House. In the Kennedy administration, which you see pictured here, there's a cabinet meeting. Kennedy's off there on the right, kind of in the middle. Uh, 71-year-old Averill Harriman was made Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Basically, that meant he was running stuff. Okay. For Kennedy and Harriman, the big issue in mid-1963 was Vietnam. Go ahead. Okay, there's a little Vietnam skinny place there. And back in those days, it, there was North and South Vietnam. North Vietnam was communist. South Vietnam uh, was an independent country. Uh, which we tried to run. Now, consensus reigned. This is from uh, a book called Choosing War, The Lost Chance for Peace and the Escalation of War in Vietnam, published in 99. He says, consensus reigned in the East Coast establishment. Okay, That meant that the people, the big, uh, the billionaires, all agreed on what should be done. Okay, In late August 1963, as the United States, and here we want to read Harriman, moved to oust the South Vietnamese leader, Diem. It had backed for the last nine years American officials, again, Reed Harriman, always opposed to an early settlement and possessing an agreement with London to work to prevent one, had seen no reason to feel particularly fearful of the prospect. Now, the words here fly by nicely, but please note that London and New York agreed, we don't want to end the war. We want the war to go on, okay? Anybody that wants the war to stop now, we're gonna take care of, okay? Now, notice that the East Coast establishment was in agreement with London about pursuing war in Vietnam, and therefore, senior officials at the White House had no fear 
to proceed with overthrowing the elected government of our ally, South Vietnam. Well, that's what Harriman decided to do. Okay? He was going to assassinate the president of a sovereign country. Okay? He used the CIA to do it without presidential approval and behind Kennedy's back while he was vacationing at Hyannisport, uh, Harriman and his cronies cabled Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., the American ambassador in Saigon, to greenlight <laughs> South Vietnamese officers to launch a coup to overthrow President Diem of South Vietnam. This is the infamous Cable 243. If you just Google Cable 243, all, a lot of this information and background will come up on your computer, okay? Now, John Kennedy, when he got back from Hyannisport, was outraged. And in the ensuing executive branch furor over the August 24th cable, and this is August 24th, 1963, the same year Kennedy was killed, okay? Attorney General Robert Kennedy, pictured here, blamed Harriman for this major mistake realizing that, quote, the government was broken in two in a very disturbing manner. I read his book, okay? When, when the Attorney General says the government is broken in two, there's something really bad going on, okay? It was because Harriman was one part of the government and the Kennedy brothers and their allies were the other part of the government. To their faces, Harriman stormed at the Kennedys and their allies in the National Security Council, calling them idiots, and then conspicuously disappeared from presidential meetings. If you go to the original <laughs> records, he called them a lot of other things. But, you know, this is the idea. Uh, the president had clearly crossed his handlers. From this day, the wheels were set in motion to remove the two unmanageable presidents who were flirting with a peaceful solution in Vietnam. So, there's uh, South Vietnamese President uh, Diem there, uh, actually in both pictures. Uh, this is after he was shot and killed uh, in uh, an armored vehicle. Okay, And uh, you'll notice it's cited as being taken, the picture, by an unnamed U.S. official serving in Vietnam. Okay. That's the CIA. Now, over President Kennedy's objections, President Diem was assassinated with CIA assistance on November 2nd, 1963. And three weeks later, on November 22nd, President Kennedy was gunned down by a CIA assassination team in downtown Dallas, Texas. The power behind the throne who ordained one assassination ordained the other. All right, so why did they want to take Kennedy out? Uh, here are the reasons. Besides offending Harriman, John F. Kennedy had signed his own death warrant by defying the shadow government in four fatal objectives. Number one, offending the Fed. He authorized the printing of $450 billion in non-debt United States notes. You know, kind of like Lincoln's greenbacks here. And a return to the Constitution's gold standard, a move to dismantle the Federal Reserve System, and that's all in Executive Order 11,110. Okay? Number two, he offended big oil. He moved to rescind the special tax privileges of the oil industry. Okay? Any one of these would get a man killed. Number three, he offended the war industrialist. He vowed the removal of all 12,000 U.S. servicemen, called advisors back then, from Vietnam by the end of 1965. Okay? That would have meant virtually that there would have been no Vietnam War. Okay? It would have spared the lives of about 58,000 young men. Not to mention all the guys that came back wounded. Uh, anyway, this was a heavy blow to the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower liked to talk about, uh, especially the helicopter division of Bell Textron Incorporated that eventually sold over 5,000 copters for the war. Bell Textron's R&D director and Washington, go ahead, lobbyist was Nazi war criminal General Walter Dornberger. Okay. Number four, he offended the CIA. 
Kennedy fired Alan Dulles, a big CFR guy, okay, from his post as director of the CIA. And he's the brother of uh, John Foster Dulles, who had been Secretary of State under Eisenhower. Uh, and he determined in October 63 to, quote, splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds and expose the Nazi war criminals who had come to infest the highest levels of our intelligence and defense industry establishment. Okay, so the CIA wanted Kennedy out of the way. These wise decisions made Kennedy a national security threat. Herein lay some of the motives for the hail of bullets that cut him down on November 22, 1963. Go ahead. <clears throat> now, here's the vehicle they're driving in. And just note, this is Dallas, okay? This is the day of the murder. And the plexiglass bubble top, which would have protected him, had been taken off. You can see there's a, a motorcycle cop there behind, uh, on, kind of on the right. The cops were normally supposed to ride on both sides of the presidential car. They were ordered back. There was another car that was supposed to be behind the presidential car, <coughs> full of um, Dallas police uh, homicide guys armed with automatic weapons. They were put out of the way uh, somewhere else in the line. In front of the presidential car, there was supposed to be a bus full of press guys taking pictures continuously. They were put out of the way too. Okay, The guy driving the car was Secret Service. And the way the route was, was made was that the cavalcade had to slow down because they came to a turn on purpose. Well, his orders, uh, standing orders, were when they were in situations like this to gas it and accelerate out of the situation. He stepped on the brake. Thank you. All right. Anyhow, witnesses heard a shot and saw a puff of smoke coming from a fence on the grassy knoll where police and others converged immediately after as shown on photos and film. A large caliber bullet slug was found opposite the knoll on the far side of Elm Street. Elm Street is where the murder was, surrounded by bits of apparent brain tissue. Okay, Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't shoot that way. You know, it's really hard to do that. Um, Shots were coming from various directions. No need exists for Arl Inspector's magic bullet as hypothesized in the Warren report. Okay, now there's the grassy knoll right there. This is an actual Polaroid photograph of the assassination, taken an estimated one-sixth of a second after the fatal headshot. You can see, oh, wow. here's, here's the police guy behind the uh, uh, motorcade. And there's Jackie leaning into him, and the president is going, uh, going down here. So this is the assassin, is one of the assassins right up here behind the wall. There were several assassins. One of them had an umbrella. The policeman behind the fence, this is the actual place uh, in color. Uh, the policeman behind the fence on the grassy knoll has been identified as Roscoe White a contract killer for the CIA through U.S. Naval Intelligence, codenamed Mandarin. White had previously executed 10 foreign officials for the company, that's what they call the CIA, the company, and had worked with Oswald at the CIA's U-2 control station at, at Sugi Air Force Base in Japan. White's wife had worked for Jack Ruby. Okay. <laughs> There's even more, yeah. Oh, yeah. White apparently killed Officer J.D. Tippett to initiate an all-point shoot-on-sight alert against the patsy Oswald. When the actual uh, firing was going on, Oswald was exiting the book depository building. He was on the ground floor. He'd, al he'd already gone up and seen the gun, and it dawned on him that he was the patsy, and so he was getting out of there as fast as he could. All right, so there's the Officer Tippett's squad car, and so... This CIA killer killed the cop so that the, uh, the whole police department would then kill Oswald so that there would be no evidence uh, and he wouldn't get to testify. 